welcome back. I am Rosalie Langmo. Thank you so much for joining me. In my last video, I said that this video would be about 14th century hairstyles. Now, I set my schedule for my channel and you would think that I would know it. I thought I knew it. I thought I knew it so well that I didn't bother to check my schedule. But um, after checking my schedule, I discovered that I'm supposed to be doing 14th century headwear. And rather than cheat and change the schedule, I decided to just um, go through it as planned. So let me get my hair up in a period hairstyle and we will just dive in. Here we are. This is my Brigitte cap. It's what we um, call them today because the only surviving extant of this cap is believed to have belonged to St. Brigida, and it is um, housed in a glass case at the, um, I hope I'm saying this right, the Bergetine uh, Convent in Uden. And it's a wonderful piece because it's all linen and it survived seven or eight centuries, which for linen is quite the accomplishment. And this piece um, we see in extant artwork um, from the Matryoshki Bible into um, the Tecuinium Santiatus, and um, there are even examples of it in 15th century statuaries where they um, have the hair, at least I assume it's their hair, bend a little bit higher and they wrap the um, tape around it and it sort of has um, that look almost of a double horned henin only not quite so dramatic. And you would see uh, women wearing this as laborers um, in Tacunium uh, Santiatus. It's clearly worn by a laundress. Um, and you see uh, worn by maids and women working in the fields in the Matryoshki Bible. However, you rarely see women wearing this in a formal setting. For instance, you wouldn't see a queen wearing this unless, um, say, we're depicting Bathsheba bathing in the Matryoshki Bible. Because this is it for a medieval nobleman, this is very, very much underwear. If she was wearing this in public, it would be worn underneath a wimple and a veil. Uh, these are very handy because they do keep your hair, your hair do contained. I have worn mine at night to um, keep my braids from getting all fuzzy so that I can just take it off and go about my day in the morning, which is very, very nice. Um, and also, they keep your hair from becoming windblown when you're at events. And in a time when women did not shampoo every other day as we do today, being able to keep um, all of the dust that's flying everywhere from settling in your hair as much as possible, well, that's very practical, not merely for uh, religious reasons, but also just as a form of hygiene. Before I go on to my next item, which is the Crispine, I wanted to show you a typical example of what reenactors or um, usually wear um, in lieu of Crispines, which is the snood or the hairnet, so that you can see the difference in how they look when worn. Now, mine is actually quite a good substitute because it does have. Um, very small square netting. This was made for me by a friend when I was doing 19th century um, reenactment. And so um, instead of having elastic through here, I have a ribbon that I can replace with finger loop braiding so that it would be closer to um, what one would see in the 14th century, although not quite perfect because it is a bit thick and um, you can see the chain stitches from the crochet. But 
as far as substitutes go, this one isn't too far off the mark and it's not too glaring as opposed to some of the other students I've used in the past. Right, let's just forget everything I said about the snood. This is my very first time ever wearing a proper crispine because I don't net to make them. This one was made and loaned me by my friend, um, Maestro Giraud de Penet of Calent here. And oh my gosh, it is so stinking pretty. Look at this. I look like Princess Isabella from Braveheart. I love this. I love this so much. I'm going to tell her I can't find it. And oh, I learned how to make them myself. Don't you like it? <laughs> Actually, she did teach me how to net and then I forgot because I was in college and I had a lot of other things to do at the time. But, oh my gosh, this is so pretty. So, as you can see, um, it's a square pattern, it's just simple network, it's very delicate and it just graces my hair. It will not hold your hair up. You must style your hair before you put on the crispine because it's just here to it's here to make it look pretty it's here to hold it all together so that it doesn't get all wispy because people would go a few days between styling their hair because this takes a lot of work and oh my goodness this is awesome so now let's go on to the next element The next element in medieval um, headwear layering is a barbette. Now mine I made to specifically so that it would get a little bit taper at my chin and get a little bit larger on my ears and then taper again at the top. I did not need to go through all that hassle. A simple rectangle will work just fine. However, I still like the way it looks. And simply kick it over the crisp. Spin, get it over my over my princess Leia buns, and you can pin it at the top or at the back. Now, when I have worn a barbette with um, vertical plaits, and if my fringes aren't wanting to go into my hair or hide well, I'll just hide it with the top of my barbette <laughs> and call it good. Um, I just need a couple of veil pins. I guess they're not going to, oh, they will match. I should have gotten these out before. And as you can see, the barbette um, does this wonderful act of sort of lifting up that little sag right here, and it helps to frame my features. I feel that with someone with a fairer complexion, like a you know, beautiful with blue eyes and rosy cheeks. Um, the barbette creates this beautiful cooling frame and then what's more with my complexion, with very dark, very dark, fe stark features, it um, also creates a lovely contrast. And um, on a cold day, I have actually grabbed a bit of wool um, and used that for my barbette underneath the veil of wimple and it was nice and toasty. Onward and yonward, as Nature Cat says. Can you tell that I have three children? When it comes to a fillet, one actually has quite a few options. Um, the very first time I made an attempt was just this bit of um, finger loop woven braid that I put on for at the last minute for an event and it turned out to be quite nice. Not quite so nice anymore, but I hold on to it for sentimentality. Um, another um, thing you can use is uh, 
a tablet woven band, which doesn't match my outfit. But when it does match your outfit, it's quite nice. And the next, um, you can also use one of just plain white linen. I used to have one, but I tore it apart so that I can make a pattern for this. And this is my favorite fillet in the entire world. It is made with silk and lined in linen. And I'm using glass bead pearls because that's what I could get at the time. Now, um, there is sort of a trend, so it, and I've done this too, um, so I did this for years. One would um, usually think that the fillet would be worn, you know, like the fantasy movie headband, and this looks nice, but um, actually if you look at the pictorial evidence, they're actually worn just along the hairline, and as you can see, it is um, a much more elegant line, and I think it messes your hair less. Because sometimes you get like your hair all messed up here, and it doesn't look quite as right, but here, yeah, it looks very good. It looks very graceful, and it like creates this very nice flow from your hairline um, down your face. But yes, this is my favorite fillet in the whole world. I wear it with everything. Absolutely everything. Even if I don't think I need it, I end up throwing it on because it makes me so happy. But you can also wear your fillet um, just with the crispy and no barbette, which you see a lot more um, in the latter half of or the latter part of the 14th century, I should say, um, you wouldn't really see a fillet without a crispine. And you wouldn't see this type of fillet, um, like, say, pre-1300. Um, but, not without, you wouldn't see this fillet without a barbette, not a crispine. And you wouldn't see it for um, pre-1300, but um, about 1315 onwards, about the time the team was ours, that's when we start to see um, a more delicate fashion. And this looks quite nice without the barbette as well. However, I'm going to leave the barbette on because over this, we are going to build our next um, two layers. So, the wimple is actually a very, very simple garment. You just take a rectangle of fabric and pull it over your chin and pin to your barbette. Mine is exorbitantly large because this was my ginormous rectangle veil I made when I first started playing. And so I wrap it a couple of times. Let's see. And the purpose really of the barbette in clothing is to act as an anchor for the rest of your headwear. I had such a hard time getting my veils to stay on until I started using a barbette. And one could also pin to a fillet, however, I find that it's really not very necessary. so pretty. And at this point, my wimble is just going to pin to itself because it's wrapped. There. And there we are. It is thought that Eleanor of Aquitaine actually made wimples popular in the 12th century um, because she was a few years older, I think about 12 years older than might be wrong on that. Um, but she was a few years older than her husband Henry II and so she wanted to disguise the fact that she was aging a bit as women do. I like these because I burn easily in the sun thanks to my autoimmune 
and so this provides lovely protection. Now the final piece. Yay! The veil. Now, oh, um, there is some contentious debate over the shape of medieval veils. I am definitely of a... I am in the non-oval camp, is the best way to put it. Um, I do recognize that on many of the statuary, um, the shape of a rectangle just doesn't quite explain the silhouette. My explanation is that it's trapezoidal with a shorter top and a longer bottom and in instances um, the corners are simply rounded and um, often goffered um, in the 14th century. In fact they were goffering veils long before they were adding the pretty um, starched frills towards the end of the 14th century. And when I put this on, oh it's so pretty. Even wrinkled, that looks nice. Find a couple of veil pins. Ouch. I try to use a minimum of veil pins when I am with my little ones for obvious reasons. Yeah, yes, and you can see, oh, sorry, I moved you. You can see it has it looks quite nice here, and then there's a bit of a ripple effect from the bias as it goes down my back. And now we have a complete 14th century headwear ensemble. Or do we? In many cases, especially um, in the 13th century and early 14th century, um, and definitely the lower in rank one is, the um, brigida cap is certainly the um, base layer that one would be begin with. Um, in the Matrioski Bible, we actually see examples of an example of a lady wearing a what appears to be a linen cap with a barbette over that cap. So I'll pin this. And then over that we add a linen fillet which has shrunk for some strange reason. Great, there's more. And over this, we can add our wimple. I'm not going to bother pinning this because I'm not going to be walking around. And then our veil. <sighs> and aren't I ready to go here, Mass? <laughs> now, one would not always wear a barbette over a crespine or Piquita's cap, indeed, um, simply with styled hair, the barbette acts as a wonderful anchor for veils. But in the Vanessa Codex, we do see uh, women depicted with flowing hair and a barbette, and then a fillet, usually a goffered fillet, like this one. And I just poked myself on one of my veil pins. Not too badly. 
And there we are. And in statuaries, we'd also see the same combination with hair that is bound back. Um, because I've only seen photos of the statues, I didn't, I can't tell you what they did with the hair in the back. It was either um, tied into a plait or um, put into a knot at the back. But I think most likely, at least in the 13th century, it was simply um, braided down the back. But this is always a very lovely, fun, frolicking combo. The next piece that would go over any fillet would be your veil. Just as with later combinations, it simply goes over. I know it seems a little strange to think that one would put a veil over this um, gaffer, but one would. And I don't need to put a pin in it because I'm not going to leave it on that long. And we see depictions of this also in the Manessa Codex. And I feel a little overdone. Rosa, you may ask, um, do I always wear the fillet above the barbette? Um, not always. I've actually seen barbettes worn wrapped around the fillet, but the fillet was like a plain white one. It wasn't a pretty one like this. Um, but yes, generally one would wear barbette, then crest beam, barbette, and then fillet, then veil. Now, a good rule of thumb is that if it is made out of cloth, even if it is one of the pretty Gofford fillets that we see in the early uh, 14th century, it goes underneath the veil. But if it's made out of metal, like a crown, it goes here. And yes, there would be extra and have a fillet and then a crown because this is awesome. And why wouldn't you? <laughs> now, if you were wearing a crown without a veil, and I left the pins off mine oh. just so I could do this easily, you would actually still wear a fillet, and often you um, wear a fillet simply for the comfort of having it act as a buffer between your crown and your head. This fillet would not do for that because it is decorated and not working. Oh, and look, there's the huscarl. All right, now that the huscarl has retreated back into his office, I'm going to sort of demonstrate the other use of a fillet with a crown, which is um, especially in the uh, 13th century and early 14th century, we see statuary um, depictions of a thick white fillet like this one being worn inside of a crown. This is not working because they were not made to fit to work together. Um, let me do it a second way. Just to show how it's done, and keep in mind, I've done this a few times and it does look awful because this is not pressed because my iron is on the fritz. Oops. And neither of these are made to fit my head anymore. For each other. But in the center you see the fillet um, stand stark against the crown, which actually creates a beautiful contrast even in this very unideal circumstance. And when everything fits properly, the fillet acts as, again, a buffer between the crown and the wearer's head. So I'm going to take this monstrosity off and go back to my favorite pretty. And there you have it, 14th century headwear. Was there more? Let me think. Of 
course there's more. There's always more. The 14th century is not inadequately um, the, the birth of fashion, even though it's silly to say that people in ancient Roman Egypt were not fashion conscious. However, oh gosh, the 14th century, just so, so much happening. And so, in this beautiful time, a common mode of headwear was a flower garland. And my hair looks a little weird from having been in the um, Leia buns all day, however. So, um, of course, the flower garlands hearken to nature and they were used um, especially prominently um, during Maying celebrations when uh, you know, spring was in full flush and all the earth was verdant and everyone was running down a maypole and making daisy chain garlands and writing sonnets to their lovers and just carrying on and wearing loads of green. And we see um, lots of flower garlands um, represented in the Manessa Codex um, worn by both men and women. And this, um, my hair is down for this depiction because in the Manessa Codex we see um, long flowing hair because that it represents youthfulness and fertility and also um, chastity. Um, we would see unmarried virgins wearing their hair down. That isn't to say that only unmarried virgins went out and enjoyed maying. Um, mothers would probably simply just wear their hair up properly and not down and loose like the hussy that I am. we have gone over everything I know about 14th century headwear, um, I wanted to take a moment while it's still fresh in my mind to discuss opacity. Because that's so important, isn't it? <laughs> um, it's very important to keep in mind when interpreting um, period artwork that we're dealing with artists who are trying to depict a certain, they have a certain goal, which is not accurately uh, presenting in perfect detail every element of the dress. And so um, it's very seldom it, when that in um, depicted artwork you'll see closures. In fact, you don't really see lacings and closures until the 15th century, even though we know that they were there um, long before um, we see their pictorial evidence. We see them in the statuaries, for example, which is a medium that thrives on um, perfect detail. Whereas, say, um, my favorite go-to, which is the Tin with Hours, is all about um, depicting this beautiful, lively hunt. Now, um, the reason I bring up opacity is because if you look at my headwear, all of it is made from linen and it is fairly, it is completely opaque. However, not all linen is the same and not all headwear was made from linen. Um, a lower class person would have her headwear um, made probably from wool, which would have been very affordable and also um, available at a much finer um, weave than um, what we can easily access today because we don't subsist off of wool fabric the way we used to, which is a shame because if we subsisted off of wool fabric more, it would be more affordable. <laughs> Sorry, that's the reenactor in me getting a little carried away. Um, but even linen fabric, you can get a handkerchief linen that is um, fairly see-through. Mine is not. This would actually make a lovely shift, but it's instead it is a veil. Um, uh, silk was also used for headwear. Everything you've seen me wear um, would would and was made from silk in addition to being made from linen. Um, and we see a lot in the artwork that the veils that are depicted um, are usually depicted as being very opaque. Um, but later on, when painting techniques seem to have improved, uh, we see um, 
depictions of a slight sheerness, for instance, the difference between a uh, rectangle veil in the Tamuth hours versus the veils worn by um, the tune of women in the Letra Psalter. And whether there is the fabric available at the time of the Tamuth hours in the early quarter of the 13th of, of the 14th century um, changed by the time of the Letra Psalter, or whether it was simply a matter of technique and depiction that is up for debate. My theory is simply that um, it's a mixture of artistic um, preference and possibly even regional preference because even when um, say in German artwork when we know that there were more see-through fabrics um, being depicted in England, say in English artwork like the Lettrell Psalter, um, the veils are still, um, and anything white, it's still very, very, very opaque. And we see a very strong evidence of the use of fabrics. For instance, um, in the Medessa Codex, there is a depiction of a woman where, several women, but one in particular wearing a, um, what looks to be a crispine that over a brightly colored blue, um, which I found very exciting because on um, the extant crispines, there's evidence that they were lined in silk. And thank God Germans love to depict <laughs> Everything is being very opaque because you can see it in the Manessa Codex. Whereas if you're looking at Crispines in um, the Tame of Hours or other pieces, it's just clearly a net that's there. You see no evidence of it being lined. So it's very much up to artistic, uh, artistic license and an educated guess on how thick you want to go. Um, personally, I look forward to having some nice sheer veils eventually. I very much like that. But right now, linen is what I have. Um, and I have blathered on long enough. Thank you again for sitting and chatting with me over 14th century headwear, which I'm sure you find as riveting as I do if you sat through this. Um, I am on Instagram, um, please come follow me there and chat with me inanely. I prattle on even more incessantly, um, which isn't a very good sell now that I think about it. And I also have my blog at myladymother at wordpress.com. Please like and subscribe and I will be back with more content on the fourth Saturday of this month. I dare not say what I'm supposed to be doing in case I mess up, <laughs> but there will be a video. Until next time, kindred spirits. Hey, Jerome. Yes, I am done filming. Thank you so much for lending me your Christine. When can I get it back to you? So anyway, all right, I will see you Thursday. Love you. Bye. I was never actually going to keep it. Tempted.